So my name is Dave Atel. Uh, also working with uh, Immunity is uh, my coworker Nicholas Weissman, uh, and of course some of the content in this slide pack is his. Uh, myself, I'm the CTO of Immunity. Uh, we're about five years old now, and I'm generally responsible for sort of guiding the, the strategic vision of the company, trying to move us into the technology we need in the future. Uh, likewise, we've come up with a few things that you may have uh, purchased. Uh, probably one of the biggest reasons uh, you, you look at something like Immunity Debugger in a new light now, uh, and a lot of the sort of research we're doing at this conference, is that uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Andrew Cushman's team over there, uh, vendors have become very aware of the security aspects of everything they do now, in particular uh, Microsoft. Uh, obviously, they're using it as a marketing tool and as a competitive advantage. And this wasn't true back when many of us started. Uh, I was talking earlier with Halvar about how, how there seems to almost be a generation gap and then if you, were, if you were a sort of youngster starting now, it'd be very difficult for you to, to really learn about buffer overflows because all the easy ones are, are sort of dead. Uh, nonetheless, uh, because they've invested all this money in protection mechanisms, the compiler things, all the other stuff that, that we talk about, uh, we needed a new sort of strategic answer, uh, uh, a long-term technology guideline that would keep uh, an attacking company, which is what Immunity does. We don't do defense, despite our name. We only do offense. Uh, we needed a strategic answer to those advances, uh, something that would keep us always relevant and always ahead of the game. Uh, and that answer, or part of that answer, is Immunity Debugger. Uh, obviously, a lot of the, the automated analysis that, that Pete back here in the front, front row is doing on the compiler level in Phoenix, uh, the ASLR and NX and GS and the hardware advances, the virtualization, all of that stuff has to be met with, a, with sort of a resounding answer. And, uh, and Immunity's answer uh, we'll be talking about shortly. Uh, obviously, as, as hackers, we operate with certain disadvantages. We don't have source code. We, we don't have access to the developers necessarily. Uh, we, we don't necessarily know the exact protocol, and there was a good talk uh, just last hour on how to sort of reverse engineer RPC very effectively. And so a lot of the complexity that goes into something very large and very commercial then has to be figured out via painstaking research by a hacking team. Uh, and the other major disadvantage, of course, is that, that as a hacker, you don't just care about vulnerabilities. This isn't a, a score. This isn't a, you know, like, you know, touch football or something. You really need to take every vulnerability and turn that into a working, reliable exploit, uh, which is an expensive, uh, difficult process and getting only more difficult. So there's two really problems here. There's the problem of finding the vulnerabilities, which uh, is a large problem, and the problem of uh, taking those vulnerabilities and making them something that is really workable uh, and and sort of pushing the boundaries at that level. So one thing that we looked at when we started developing Immunity Debugger is what are the sort of, people call hacking an asymmetric warfare event, but in reality it is not. It's just one of those things people like to say because they've heard someone else say it. Uh, the game usually goes the person with the most money and resources. And uh, that's, not, that's not immunity by any means. Uh, we're, we're much smaller than even the smallest AV company. Uh, but hackers are always used to working in tightly knit, sort of small focused teams. It's, it's something that's intrinsic to their nature as you all log on to IRC right now and use the wiki and whatnot. You, you really do see a, a social fabric that already exists. Uh, you see the fact that most hackers are generalists. They have a broad range of knowledge. Uh, they can target Unix, Cisco, and Windows equally well, hopefully. Uh, they're they're well-versed in web applications and they can bring uh, some of the aspects of that into their Windows exploitation measures. So, so that's another major advantage we wanted to look into. Uh, and of course, because the hackers are working among groups that are used to trading and information, they have a natural security boundary. They're not feeding uh, the attack services and attack classes back to the wider community 
uh, and, and having them disappear. There's been sort of an uh, extinction event in vulnerabilities recently, and uh, much like the dinosaur event. Uh, and, and, and clearly, the, the, that's resulted in a, in a social desire to prevent the last few remaining flightless birds from uh, disappearing. So, and, and this is my prediction, which is that uh, there, there's a level of profound innovation happening sort of due to stress, the same way things evolve quickly when they're getting eaten by larger animals. Uh, and, and the hacker community has, has gone through a lot of, I think, rather rapid innovation. Uh, you're looking at, at, at teams that are, that are doing uh, strong work at analysis engines. You're looking at people learning economics and running companies in order to obtain the resources that they need to do the work they want to do. Uh, you're looking at integration of everything you do into larger tool sets. And you're looking at uh, really productizing the teamwork and coordination that you do already. So, so I think these advantages are, what, are what's going to keep the hacking community ahead of the, of the sort of defensive community for the next short future. Uh, in terms of interfaces, uh, personally, I've used a lot of debuggers, maybe not all the debuggers, but in the Windows world, I grew up on uh, you know, soft ice, like many of us. And I've used GDB extensively and ADB a little bit. And of all the debuggers, this one has the best interface. Uh, and you'll notice that it's almost identical, but not quite, to the Ali debug interface. Because once you get used to right clicking, you find that it's just much faster. And the visual components of it prevent your brain from having to uh, learn things. Because your brain has a limited number of cycles available. And you want it focusing on the problem and not doing visualization internally. And uh, as Halvar said, we're, we're, we're certainly better at looking at graphs than looking at assembly. There's just a better sort of brain structure for that. So uh, you'll notice that, that if you look at the, the GUI, and we, and we, we did everything very specifically, uh, the, there's a little WinDebug-like command line, uh, which essentially is like WinDebug. And at some point, we can switch that over to a GDB-like command line, because that's what I liked better. Uh, the GUI is usable, and you can touch almost all parts of the debugger with pure Python graphing and whatever else you need. So it exposes all the APIs internally that you would ever want. And of course, if you don't get an API, you email Ami and he adds it the next release uh, or gives you a beta to test. So uh, the debug a debugger is your key thing. If you're a, a decent hacker, you spend about you know, half your day at least inside your debugger and static analysis tool. And this, this of course, for me at least, replaces both. Uh, largely, I mean, I, I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel every time I go into an exploit development session. Uh, safe SEH uh, discovery, I mean, the goal is that you just print out all the safe SEH things and then iterate through them, and uh, I could probably do a demo later. Uh, stack and heap variable sizing. I want to know how big the stack variable is. I want to do it in a programmatic way. You can, there's some quite simple algorithms for that sort of thing. Uh, and we realize that your workflow as an exploit writer is that you create these tiny little one-time use uh, analysis scripts while you're working. So you're, you're looking and you're like, I wish I could answer the following question. Where in this program between point A and point B is a function pointer called that uh, is in this following data segment within a following range. So you have a sort of question you want answered. And now, instead of sort of manually looking at stuff and doing all that stuff, now you write a quick little Python script. It takes you maybe an hour. And you answer the question, and then you move on. And so your, your workflow process is sort of very important as you go through your exploit development. Uh, and of course, you're, you're doing a lot more. You're combining your static and your runtime analysis. So as I do my. And, and Greg Hoagland and Havar Flake have been uh, doing this for quite some time. But as, as you sort of do your coverage analysis and, and you can watch variables go through memory and see what the ranges are, instead of solving for constraints, maybe you just want to know a sample of what it could look like in one run. So a lot, a lot of that stuff you can, you can also do and sort of combine and contrast. There's a little mini database built into it. Uh, Essentially, I mean, if you've been in the talks I've been in, you've heard talk after talk of Python-oriented tools. Uh, obviously, 
we, we, we build as much functionality as possible into the debugger, but when we're, we, we see someone else doing great work, it's great to be able to just sort of plug it in and have it just work. Uh, and of course, we have an exploit framework completely written in Python. There's an x86 emulator out there that's quite useful. Uh, and we do a lot of work by exposing stuff via XML RPC. So if, for example, you want to automatically write an exploit, you sort of have the debugger start the process, attach the process, and you communicate with it over XML RPC, which is useful. Uh, one thing we're, we're working heavily on is doing good uh, sort of essentially Git, I have SVN written down there, but Git is a better model for hackers, uh, for version management and tracking changes and all this stuff. So instead of the whole world reverse engineering all the same DLLs, essentially all independently, uh, you at least internally in your team can reverse engineer a, a fairly large project together and uh, have that version checked and, and be able to merge and contrast with other work that people have done. Uh, and tools like Bindiff are useful in, in combining and contrasting different languages, for example. So, uh, like, we all use IRC on a daily basis, and that's great, but uh, you'll find that if your team gets big enough, you're really wasting a lot of time trying to communicate with other people when it'd be great if you could just say, here, look at this. This is what I've commented up. This is what the data looks like. Here's the last 50 instructions that just happened, and here's my graph that I'm looking at. So, uh, Sort of being able to, you know, do fingerprints on functions. That stuff's in there now. Uh, doing a sort of global RE database. That stuff's coming soon. Uh, so uh, you can look at Pedro Amini's uh, or OpenRCE's uh, sort of IDA sync tools. And I think in a year that will be your default. What you do, you sort of version check in, version check out, and you're ready to go. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time, the whole world spends a lot of time on web applications because that's where the money is, that's where the exposed perimeter is. As much as uh, the keynote said that we don't have perimeters, if I want to hack something, it probably has a perimeter and it probably starts on the web server, uh, or could. Um, one, one thing we notice is you spend a lot of time, uh, for example, looking at WebSphere applications that were originally developed for Solaris and then they sort of said, well, you know, WebSphere runs on Windows. Let's put it on a Windows server and we can manage it via Windows. And uh, so we like that approach because they don't understand the file system. You end up having a lot of really interesting bugs. Uh, and we wanted to find them faster than just sort of uh, manually testing them. And the way we do that now is we, we sort of via XML RPC pipe back all the file operations, all the, all the opens essentially, and all the database operations. So we don't have any blind SQL injection because we have a view on that operation and the program does it. And this script is on the, there's a forum.immunityinc.com and you can download that script. And of course you can download the debugger right now as well. I think we're up to release 1.2 and you can download everything that you see here. Uh, so, I mean, essentially, it, it's SQL hooker and SQL listener, uh, and you get the data in whatever format you like, and you can do automatic SQL injection, for example. Did, is that filter bypassable via the following method? You can try it and see what the database server gets. Uh, although we do hook the web server, not the database server, because the database server usually can't reach the internet, uh, which was fun. Uh, so, we have a, a pretty long section following on heap overflows. Uh, we call it uh, the heap overflow is dead, long live the heap overflow, because you know, in honor of the many Brits here. Uh, certainly in the past, and we go over it in a bit of depth following, uh, the common way you would exploit a heap overflow is you would overwrite the heap metadata, you would cause a heap operation to occur, and then you would get a write for primitive, which you would then write a function pointer, and you would then have some sort of shellcode execution. It's great. Unfortunately, uh, Microsoft figured that out, and so did Linux and everyone else, and uh, now that dinosaur is dead. Uh, the sent, I mean, like, the, the sort of terms, and many of us in this room are extremely familiar with these terms, but for those of us that are not, uh, the unlink write for primitive means that when they, they take the uh, heap structures and pull them apart and put them back together, you, you end up getting a four bytes into any four other bytes in memory that you'd like. Uh, 
And, and one thing we noticed was uh, people, when they researched how to bypass this, researched a, a, they're looking for generic methods to bypass like heat cookies. And the whole point of the protection was that it de defeats all the generic methods. And it's, it's easy to see that there won't be a generic method for defeating uh, heap cookies and unlink checks. And we can go over a little bit here, what we're talking about. Uh, XP Service Pack 2 was the first OS uh, from Microsoft where they introduced this, in my knowledge. Uh, and you can just see a little mini out, a little pseudocode here. Uh, B link means uh, backwards link, F link means forwards link. And in pseudocode, you can see the link list getting uh, unlinked, and they do a check to make sure that everything is copacetic before they proceed, which foils are right for. Uh, and obviously, this is another beautiful graph. So the, the, the heap data also uh, has, in the low fragmentation heap at least, has uh, sort of checksums and various other protections that you're going through. In addition to being a bit more complex, it's also going to have a bit more reliable protection mechanisms. Uh, and uh, clearly we've been looking heavily at Vista and uh, the newest immunity debugger that you download now, or the 1.2 version, will be able to decode the Vista heap structures and memory. Uh, and you can get a full Python readout of exactly how we do that because everything is uh, uh, maybe not capital O, capital S open source, but at least viewable for you. Uh, and certainly, I think the newest, the version coming out this month will, it's better than Windabug's tool for the same purpose. Uh, and likewise, if you overflow the check and then they, they free the object and do collection, uh, they can tell that you've modified it, which is not good. Uh, there, there is obvious, if you look at the general size of the problem, they have a checksum, you've, you've corrupted it. You can defeat that by having a memory uh, disclosure of vulnerability first. And you'll start seeing hackers combine a lot of vulnerabilities to do that. Uh, but regardless, pretending we can't do that, uh, we want to defeat the following s bevy of things. And the thing that's not listed on here is the, uh, is the PEAT and the compiler and the, the many consultants that have been brought into Microsoft to uh, squash the bugs individually, and all the other sort of things like the uh, prefast and prefix and all that other stuff. So those, those are sort of a, a, in the same boat. We want to solve all the problems by finding bugs they can't and exploiting bugs they think are unexploitable or that uh, we are reduced to scourging for. So we include here a list of sort of references to other heat papers that you can read. And our conclusion based on these heat papers is that there is no generic bypass. So you can spend a lot of time analyzing the data structures and the algorithms, and you'll still come to the conclusion that it's really not that hard to prevent the right four from happening. And as Sanan says, who's one of our uh, other researchers, he says that he can make a strawberry pudding with that many prerequisites. Uh, which he means like, yeah, okay, if you have the following data structures and the following craziness, you get a right four because you know the data structures are the same. He's like, that's never going to happen. We need a better way. Uh, so what we do is we have a methodology that reliably generates application-specific right fours from uh, heap corruption vulnerabilities. Uh, and all, the, all this good stuff is in Immunity Debugger right now, but maybe uh, you, it's hard to use. That's the way it is. Uh, and you'll know that uh, many of the good heap overflows have been very strictly controlling the heap in the past five years or whatever. You'll see, I know we have a list of the ones we've done or that Nico realistically did. And uh, so, so we, we've, we come to the real, you can strictly control the heap and then what is our question. Uh, and here's some examples. We, we use the spooler exploit against 2000 and you do like a multiple write fours to write a shell code into memory, and then you jump to that shell code after corrupting a pointer. It's quite, quite a good one. Uh, we, we sort of define a term, a soft mem leak and a hard mem leak, and I'll go into what those are later and how we use them. And of course, uh, all the old ones you'll see in Canvas today use write fours from the heap algorithms themselves. Uh, and, and this is sort of how you do that. You have uh, you have the debugger sort of tracing the allocations. 
you have your reverse engineering process, understanding the complete architecture of the program, and you sort of dissolve the program into a collection of uh, heap manipulation primitives. And of course, understanding the heap algorithm, and there's some really good, uh, good papers on this, and we just touch on it briefly here. And this is the look side, which is a sort of little mini cache. And the free list, which will look like this, and you can come back to this later. And the, uh, the sort of chunk coalescing where they combine two chunks to make one big free chunk, which is useful. And of course, you want to know when they split the chunks. And we go, the reason we sort of abstract this is because not every program uses, in fact, many don't use the Microsoft heap at all. Uh, Mr. Esser over there was talking about how Zend uh, invented their own heap algorithm, which is perfectly okay. And now they've added specific checks into their heap algorithm to sort of duplicate the work that everyone else has already done in the standard heap algorithms. So uh, this, these techniques are applicable to both the sort of default heaps on, on various architectures, but also the specific heaps that random Bob, the big programmer, thought he was cool enough to invent all by himself. So we have, as part of our development process, and if you're looking at it from an economic standpoint, we usually invest between one and six months in writing a good heap overflow, which means we believe our heap overflows will last for the conceivable future of a product. Uh, so before, before the overflow, the heap is in a state. And what you see in a lot of bug track postings is people assume that the heap is in a stable state. But that heap, uh, not even the most perfect heap overflow, is going to work on more than 80% of the machines. Because the heap on my laptop, for some reason, is always different from everyone else and vice versa. So uh, assuming that you have some understanding of a heap, uh, and it's in a default state, people have connected, deconnected, the freeze, mallocs have happened. Uh, the overflow occurs, corrupts memory, and there is then a, a write for, and Nico has this in quotes, because uh, write for may not necessarily be a write for. Any memory access will do. Uh, hopefully a memory write. Uh, and of course, typically we then use a function pointer. And there's some great uh, features in Immune Debugger for finding the function pointer that is used after you've corrupted a heap. So you corrupt the heap, you type bang func pointer, or I think pointer mod, or he named it something funny. You hit enter, and then you run the program some more, and it tells you when the next function pointer is hit. Because you really want the very next function pointer. Uh, and the way he does that is modify all the function pointers to uh, be one, two, three, four, and then wait till the access violation happens. Which is simplistic, but good. And of course, you also have to survive your, pay your, your payload running. And in Windows, this is exceptionally hard, because many of the APIs use A or the heap you're, trying, you're corrupting. So lately, we've had a similar level of success by corrupting uh, cryptographic tokens instead of uh, using GUI function pointers. And this is us trying to defeat uh, the DEP and the NX bits. Because sometimes all you want to do is make an Xbox or an Xbox turn into a bad Xbox, something perhaps a bit more trivial, crackable, and then log in. Because I, if I can log in, I can log in. And I don't have to worry about that. Uh, so that's, that's certainly one angle that I think you're going to see a lot more of in the future. And I believe David Litchfield's giving a talk on that tomorrow, sort of. Uh, so assuming you understand the algorithm, the, the, the first step of any heap overflow is to fill the heap holes. And we have a, a cute little animation here and a little vulnerable function. And this, in effect, is the exchange uh, x, x link state vulnerability uh, done right. Uh, you can make it quite reliable. Uh, so assuming that the free list has a, as a, uh, as a, there's a chunk missing out of the contiguous chunks, it's a little bit fragmented. And then you do allocate, and then you fill that in, and you do another allocate, and it'll allocate it from the end of the uh, memory section. You do your overwrite, and you've overwritten something that you have no idea how big it is and what it has. So in terms of uh, predictability, you have really none. But in the past, and in, in many cases, if you look at sort of advisories and like my old paper, we ignored this whole problem. Uh, so in order to solve this problem, 
to make the heap overflow predictable, we need to find one of two kinds of memory leaks, which is I want to be able to tell the program to allocate memory and not free it. And I can do that either in a hard way, which means uh, typically it's a bug in the program. This is the sort of thing that, that, that programmers are really looking for, which is uh, something that will remain allocated forever, essentially. They've lost it. And the other thing is a soft memory leak. And these are much easier to find, almost as useful. Uh, often they have a timeout that restricts you. So on the, like if you're hacking China or something, then your, your exploit will fail because you timed out and it got free. Uh, but assuming you're not, uh, memory leaks that are often there because you just connected multiple times. So I know that I can fill up memory just by connecting 15 times. And uh, if you're looking for hard memory leaks, the typical one is when they raise exceptions and they just forget the free memory. Uh, and this is the, the sort of very primitive uh, abstraction of what the vulnerability was. You would say, I want you to allocate 400x bytes, and then you would say, here's the last one, and it'll free that. So given that we devolve the algorithm into just allocate and free, allocate and free. And we make, I think, three connections, and, and one, two of them we allocate, and the other one we free. Uh, so we empty the data, and this realistically uh, is very specific to the, to the Microsoft one, but works just as well uh, slightly differently to the uh, sort of proprietary allocators you'll see in all sorts of software. So this is what we really want to do. We want a mem leak, and we want to fill that little chunk, and we know exactly how big we want that mem leak to be, so we want to be able to specify the memory size. We then want to let them allocate twice and then do the overflow. So this is still very timing dependent because if someone else is allocating and freeing on the side of us, they may interrupt our process and otherwise piss us off. Uh, and of course, here is the next stage of our lives, which is getting a function pointer uh, working. So uh, we call it intelligent debugging, the sort of process where you're creating a, uh, essentially a script to do your debugging and you have a much greater wide area of knowledge about what the program is. Uh, you're no longer just x slash 2i. And this is essentially, that was our, uh, many years ago, our, our uh, project plan. We're like, what are the requirements for our new debugger? And this is what it looks like. You can, you can do all these things now. Uh, many of these scripts are uh, Nico's work. You can dump the heap the same way you could in uh, WinDebug. So if you're used to writing your heap overflows in WinDebug, which used to be your only real option, then uh, you will feel at home. And that was our goal, because we've been teaching classes for a long time on how to do heap overflows, and we wanted all the class material to still work perfectly well on the new debugger. And it looks like this in a teeny tiny little font, and you can, of course, replicate uh, this in your own copy of Immune Debugger. You can search it. There's a little scripty language. So if you want to search the heap for various things, then uh, you could, you're like, these are, this is where you're an answering the questions that you have in your head. You're like, what block on the heap is exactly 768 bytes? And then it pops out. Uh, one important thing that, that you're not going to get realistically with a normal debugger that is not sort of vulnerability focused is being able to sort of corrupt the heap and sort of snapshot and restore the heap structures so you can see what happened. So uh, the, this sort of, this is a really useful feature if you're doing some of the more complex heap overflows. Uh, we also do uh, sort of the flow of a, pro of a rather large chunk of the program, sort of a feature of the program. I want to know how that affects the heap in a general sense. And we call that heap fingerprinting, heap fuzzing. And you can, uh, you can fingerprint the allocation pattern and find double freeze quite easily and that sort of thing. And, and mostly I look for uh, mem leaks using this. So that's, that's sort of automated. You go, oh, well, I'm at the stage of my exploit where I need a mem leak. All right, let's go. And then instead of spending years looking for one, it just tells you that a heap was freed but not allocated, and then it detected a mem leak, and this is the data that was in the mem leak. 
So all right away I know in my packet what it was that filled that memory leak and I can start adjusting the size and seeing how big I can make it and how small I can make it and that's, that's where you've started really controlling the, uh, the process of writing a heap overflow. And uh, you can't see it very well there but it will be on the uh, website shortly. So uh, not only do you need to know uh, the structure of the heap but you need to know the data on the heap. Uh, and essentially the, the, the step that heap overflows have moved to, the reason we say they are still alive and will, will remain alive over the next conceivable future is that you can take a lot of advantage of the content of the chunks and now you can do that in a sort of more automated, much easier to use fashion. It's, it's no longer a theoretical, uh, I wish I could do that. It is now a, my exploit works because I did that. Uh, and in order to do that, we have to look at heap data and then be able to tell you what type that is. So in the, in the heap, you do a heuristic and you say it looks like a linked list, it looks like a string, or it looks like this data or that data. So uh, the most important in sort of a trivial fashion is the doubly linked lists that are everywhere on the heap because everyone has a double linked list on their heap somewhere. And if you can move uh, a chunk from the doubly linked list, into the chunk that you overflow and then have that double linked list free itself or otherwise manipulate itself, uh, you now have another perfectly good write for. And you can do all that using the data discovery stuff. See the awesome screenshot in light green? Maybe we should have turned off the lights. But uh, essentially what you're seeing here is it says here's the chunks in the thing and here's the data in them and what types they are. And then at the bottom I think there's a linked list, which is what we ended up overflowing. Uh, so I mean the fact that you can script this up and then on your fuzzer side sort of fuzz stuff and just see did any data structures get on the heap after my data that I think are useful? Anything at all? What does it look like? Uh, are there function pointers? Are, are there, you know, linked list, structures of strings, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, a, a lot of the stuff that we talk about here sounds very easy in theory and then you end up going to do it and it takes you six months, which may be an investment you can make and it may not be an investment you can make. And you start seeing a, a sort of drop off of the, of the people who can invest that kind of time and energy into writing one heap overflow, uh, which is okay with me. but speaks poorly for the future. Uh, so, so we tried to automate some of that, the heap layout creation, the heap filling, the memory leak finding, and, and we have that, call it fuzzing the heap. Uh, so ask, you can ask the questions like, um, I'm, I'm in a chunk, tell me what is in the other chunks near me, and that sort of thing. And, and maybe try something else and tell me again. And once I get a different answer, that might be worth manual analysis. So, and, and again, this stuff's all freely available and easy to use, I think. And if you have any questions, we have a forum where people answer you 24 hours a day. And this is sort of what it looks like. You see that he's checking a chunk and, and tells you what's, what's up. And you will notice that we have nice colors and everything, too. So, Let's say that, uh, for example, you had an overflow in Internet Explorer or LSAS or Exchange or, I don't know, you pick something big. Uh, they usually are doing something in the meantime while you're doing it. So you're overflowing that process, but they have timers and thread pools and all sorts of craziness and logging going into the background. Those are all going to be doing allocations, and if you start slowing the process down by hooking using int threes, all the allocations, because you want to watch a stream of allocations, uh, they do something very different from what they would normally do. And this, this means that you can't use OlliDebug to write heap overflows, essentially. Because the, they, OlliDebug uses up all the CPU, and uh, that means that the process does something completely differently under the memory allocations than, uh, than it would normally do, which means your exploit only works when OlliDebug is attached, which is not what you want. So, uh, we have an inject hook, which is just a quick little API you can use. And it, it maps some memory in the process, adds a little, sort of creates a little function in the process that it will then call into, 
at any time allocate heap or free heap gets used, uh, and it will log that data in the in the map memory space, at which point you can retrieve it later. So the idea is you, you hook the things, you run your little fuzzer, it fills up some, some memory, and you pull the data back and you see what happened, uh, which is just as fast as running the program normally and allows you to do some of the more complex heap overflows. But I will warn you, if you do about a 1,000 or so inject hooks, you'll notice that uh, the process stops working the way you we're hoping. And it's quite simple to use in Python, as of course. And uh, so you hook it up, you give it a tag, and then you can pull the data out of that tag. So this is, uh, I mean, the future, we're working on heap simulators, we're working on uh, the heap fuzzers, we're working on integrating it with automatic sort of uh, exploit writing toolkits. Uh, and being able to, to find out exactly when heap overflows happened uh, is, is sort of the beginning of, of, of what we're doing in the future. And we can automate a lot of things that we do now, doing protocol analysis and all that good stuff. Uh, so here's where we are, and where we are today, hopefully, is not where we're going to be tomorrow. Uh, it's become extremely costly to write heap overflows, uh, but using the right tools, this, this does defeat XP Service Pack 2, and it does in a way that they're not going to fix. And it will defeat Vista probably next month, and uh, it'll take on 2003 SP2 as well. So these techniques work, and uh, you can download the debugger for free, and then you can learn how to write overflows, which is fun. Uh, and of course, on older Windows platforms, it will generate a reliable heap overflow much, much faster. So if you're looking at Windows 2000 or for whatever reason, NT4, or a custom allocator that doesn't have protections, this is going to help you 100 times more than what you're doing before. And of course, uh, we have a form that you can log on to at forumimmuniteinc.com, and you can feel free to email me. And that is the top. And we have a, uh, I don't have a demo, but I do have a, you know, copy of it running in the background. So if anyone needs a particular question, maybe I can answer it in an actual debugger. Does anyone have any questions? Rich, how you doing? Yeah, we can only bite off so much. Yeah, I was just going to say, what would you think of behind that? Why did you choose to stick looking at operating systems like books rather than move outside the operating system and start looking at other devices on the network or uh, other devices in the body? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I think there's probably a lot of interesting research to be done on embedded devices. Uh, they require a different level of investment. Uh, this is something that a team of 13, 14 people can do well, we thought, as opposed to something that would require sort of a much more massive in, like upfront investment before you started seeing. And of course, the market for us is still bread and butter is Win32 overflows. And that's what people run. You know, and, and probably there's another good market out there that maybe someday we'll approach. What are you up to? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I didn't repeat the question. Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, how long do you think it will take before uh, actually exploiting uh, the low-level vulnerabilities like overriding function pointers become so hard that instead of that, like I think you mentioned like overriding a uh, structure that contains some, some security token. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not hard yet, so... Yeah. How long do you think it will take before that gets to the point where instead of actually attacking that kind of low-level uh, functions of, of like more like the operating system even, or uh, the heap, when it comes to the point where instead of that you're attacking the actual uh, data that the process uses instead of the structures that store the data? And that, that's what this is. We don't, we don't attack the, the metadata anymore. We only attack the, the data in the heap. But you still, uh, as you said, you were uh, attacking a, a, we were looking for a linked list. So you were looking for a, uh, for instance, a, a linked list inside the heap data, not like. Right. 
So you're still attacking a, a low level. Yeah, and it, it is a sort of programmatic, and, and we have had moderate success attacking sort of cryptographic tokens as well, but it's, I like having shellcode run, so in, in, by default I'll go for that first. But yeah, I mean, you, you're starting to see a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of research going on in, in finding out, and I don't, I don't know where that slide has run off to here. You, you find a lot of stuff looking at, like, cracking an S-box in two, or, I mean, the problem then is you have to restore it at some point, because uh, otherwise people can't log in except for you, and that makes them worried. But maybe that's not a problem. Cool. Well, thank you for uh, talking. Hopefully you'll download the debugger and uh, chat with us online about it.